Hey guys, Pete here. So this is the follow-up to my video yesterday. It's going to be my part 18, 10 things you might have missed video. If you haven't watched the return of Twin Peaks all the way through to the end of the series, then you're going to want to stop watching this video right now because it will have major, major spoilers. So I was working on this for the last couple of days, and it's kind of frustrating because there's so many good theories out there, and it's kind of affecting my point of view a little bit. I tried to pick these out in an objective way, though, because there's actually several theories out there that make some sense. They all have good parts, and a lot of times I think that the writing is what wins you over whenever you read it. Like, if someone really makes a good case for what they're saying, it pulls you into that theory. But I do believe that it's supposed to be somewhat open-ended, and, you know, I've never made my videos in a way that I wanted to try to tell anybody what to think, but rather just put all the stuff out there so you can draw your own conclusion. So anyways, let's jump into it. So the first thing you might have missed was that the power lines at the 430 mile marker have a definite resemblance to the Owl Cave symbol and the marking we saw of what we expect to be Judy on Evil Coop's Ace of Spades. What's interesting about this is that when I first saw it, I thought, you know, well, that's kind of an interesting little trick to make us realize that that's an evil place or whatever. But when you think about it, that's not what it is at all, or at least I don't think so anymore. It's the 430 is something that came directly from the giant. So it's really just a part of the plan. It's a, you know, it's just a marker to help Agent Cooper and Diane know that they're going the right place. The second thing you might have missed is the song that's playing when Cooper and Diane have their little lovemaking session is the same song that was on the radio in episode 8. It's a tune called My Prayer, and, you know, it was playing whenever the woodsman went into the radio station and started breaking people's heads. <laughs> So it is the same song. It's from a band called The Platters. And interestingly enough, there's a guy in the band named David Lynch that's not the director of this movie, David Lynch. Does it mean something directly? Well, I don't think that they would use the same song otherwise. I don't have a great explanation other than it connects those two scenes together. And why I think that's important ties into the next thing that you might have missed. And that is that Cooper especially, but Diane and Cooper together have a plan once they get into that hotel room. And it looks to me like they understand it'll be uncomfortable, if not a painful experience. So what we saw when we heard that song play the last time was we saw the woodsman repeat his saying or his hypnotic chant or whatever you wanted to call it over and over until the townspeople went to sleep and eventually that moth frog could enter the little girl's mouth. This could be the same sort of thing, or it could be the opposite thing. Um, this is where the different theories start to converge, and I won't go into it too deeply here, but I do think that this was a ritualistic thing that they do, they're doing here. There's talk about sex magic and Jack Parsons in The Secret History, which wouldn't be there for no reason, I wouldn't imagine. And without going off on a complete tangent, I would just say that I think that what they're doing here is similar to what that would be. It could be a summoning thing, like I said, or it could be more of an opposite where they're trying to seal off this area or this alternate dimension so that Judy can't get back out. We remember in the beginning of the series, whenever Sam and Tracy had sex, that that's when Judy came into, or we called her the experiment model at that point, but something, either Judy or an avatar or whatever you would want to call it, came through the glass box is, was probably in direct relation to the fact that they were doing that. So Coop and Diane has a, it's a very weird scene and it has a lot, I mean, it goes on for a long time. Neither one seems to be enjoying it. And it seems to me that that is something that they knew was going to happen and they were doing it for a specific purpose. You could say that, you know, Diane saw her doppelganger outside and that's an indication of her fear about what happened in the past with Evil Coop. And that's why that they knew this was going to be a bad experience or whatever. 
But I think the fact that Coop is just not really engaged when we've seen him that way in the other scenes when they're affectionate. So you know what I mean? Like, I think that it's not so much that Cooper's a different person here. It's that he understands the gravity of the situation. They're doing this for a greater good, not for pleasure. And that's not to say that I don't think Cooper changes over his time in this dimension, but we'll get into that later. So the next thing that you might have missed, but probably not, because it was pretty darn obvious, was that the motel and car change overnight. They're in like what looks like a 60s model Lincoln whenever they cross over. They check into a one-story motel in room seven, but when they wake up, Coop gets the note from Diane that says that, you know, he's Richard and she's Linda. And then when he walks out, we see that the motel is completely different. It's two stories now, and that the car is a newer model, similar to the one that he drove earlier in season three as Evil Coop. Again, I think this is actually a clue to the fact that this is all part of his plan since they now have the names that the firemen spoke to Coop in, you know, that scene in the very beginning. Initially, after the episode aired, there were theories popping up that maybe Richard was who Coop really was and everything before that was a dream. I never really thought that sounded right, and when you watch it again, it gets even more unlikely. To me, it seems like Coop is still himself, but he becomes less connected to that self as episode 18 goes along. This gives weight to the idea that he has to remember who he is in this journey and what the ultimate goal is, or they will, in fact, lose. The next thing you might have missed was the white horse totem in Carrie Page's house. I've been calling it a totem in my own headcanon since the definition of totem basically means like an animal or a natural object that has some kind of spiritual significance to a society or a group of people, and then they take that on as their emblem. This particular horse, the way that it's positioned on the mantle, kind of like, it kind of looks like the horse is the white of the eyes and the dark within. So this is likely in reference to Judy, of course, like other white horses and that imagery we've seen in other scenes throughout the series, really. The next thing was a telephone pole outside. It has the number six plate on it, which we've seen in other locations. You probably noticed this right away, but it's interesting because this is the same one that we saw the giant show Andy in that sequence whenever he got sucked into the vortex. This is a pretty heavy-handed hint that the firemen knew what was going to go on before Cooper and Diane crossed over, which should also mean that Cooper knew as well. Does it mean that the firemen constructed this world within a world? That's up for debate. Different people have different feelings about that. I think it makes more sense that he did, instead of, say, the alternative idea that Judy made this world so that, you know, she could trap Coop and Laura in the same place. It makes a whole lot more sense that this was set up by the firemen as a way of keeping Judy away from the world that we knew before. The next thing you might have missed was the double R actually looks different when they pass it. When Richard Coop and Carrie Laura drive past the double R, the double R to go logo isn't painted on the front of the building anymore. This has been mentioned in connection with the idea that this alternate dimension could have been constructed by Laura since she would remember what the double R looked like when she was alive. This is another rabbit hole that I'm not going to get into right at this moment, but that does make a a bit of sense, although it could also be consistent just with the fact that that wouldn't have happened maybe in the alternate version of the story. The next thing you might have missed is that the woman who plays Alice Tremont is the actual current owner of the Palmer House. The house now there in Everett, Washington is owned by Mary and Timothy Reber, and they bought it in 2014, which is pretty cool because they got to be in the movie. And folks found this out because one of their children had tweeted it after the episode. Now that's a neat little Easter egg, but it's really not the most important thing because you probably didn't miss the fact that it's no coincidence that those are the names that they have, you know, the Chalfonts and the Tremonts. And it means that there is a definite influence or direct connection to the Lodge. 
We know that our hero, Carl Rod, mentioned that there were two families named Chalfont that rented the space at the old fat trout where Chet Desmond disappeared. We know that the, the Chalfonts is a name that's been used by the old woman as well as Traymon. So even though this alternate reality doesn't have Sarah Palmer living in that house, it does, in fact, still have Judy's influence in one way or the other. And that's pretty much where we get to the last thing. And again, it's not something that you miss, but it's something that we need to talk about. The electricity goes out in that house in a fairly dramatic fashion. And if you think about the way the scene is set up, Cooper comes out. He looks like he's having a very hard time keeping it together at this point. Perhaps he's losing his connection with his, the reality that he left behind temporarily to go on this mission. We hear after he says, what year is this? We hear Laura's mother from the pilot say her name, yell her name like she did. And this causes Laura to remember and scream. At this point, this is all happening in real time in this dimension. So it's not like this is some kind of trickery or some kind of dramatic filming or filmmaking, I should say, in order to just put a, you know, a, a period on the end of the sentence. Something clearly happens when she screams. Does it mean that Judy is then defeated? I mean, it probably does, if you think about it. A lot of people have brought up this idea of playing both of these episodes together, and I'm not, I'm, the jury's still out on this for me. Like, I don't know for sure that it was done on purpose, at least not the whole episode, because I started watching it before I read any of the theories, and it just didn't stand out as being, like, intentional at first. I did read the theories later, and they're fine, but you don't really need to watch both episodes at the same time to get that same explanation. You know what I mean? The information's there either way, and I don't agree with the entirety of it, but that's how all of them are. There's quite a few good ones. There's the real world one. There's the idea that, you know, Judy created this world to trick Cooper, and then there's the idea that it's a pocket dimension made by the giant to trick Judy. And they all have pretty good write-ups to go along with them, and they all kind of make sense. So I think what we witness here, though, is we do witness a destruction of sorts. You know, the theme of electricity has been recurring throughout this series, and we've seen Laura has been presented as the entity to balance out against Judy. So it would appear to me that we're at least supposed to think that it's possible that it happened. And, you know, we cut to the, the scene of her whispering in Dale Cooper's ear in the Red Room, and you could kind of figure out how she might just be explaining the plan or what they have to do. And this is kind of a good ending, but it's kind of a bad ending because... If you think about that, the reason why they want to get Judy outside of the world and contain her was because her destruction would probably destroy a lot more along with her. And that means that Cooper and Laura probably die as well. You can't know any of that for sure, but I can't imagine that that'll be completely popular or adopted as a for sure kind of ending to the series and to the character of Dale Cooper. So we will think about this for a long time, and that's good as far as I'm concerned. There's going to be desperation for people to insist that they're correct in their interpretation. If the past dictates the future, there really won't be a right answer. And, you know, like I said, for what it's worth, I don't think that it's... If you look at the reality of what these two guys have put together... David Lynch and Mark Frost, it doesn't seem very likely that we'll ever know for sure or that they made this little Easter egg that if you play both episodes at the same time, suddenly everything makes sense. I do think we'll get a lot more about things in the final dossier, but I don't think it'll be all that much different than anything else that we've had in the Twin Peaks universe. I, I think that it'll just give us more to think about. And, you know, they're, they're familiar with the fact that there's a hive mind out there trying to solve their mystery. So they're not going to give it to anybody very easily. But they will stoke the fires, and I'm excited about that. So give this video a like if you liked it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Please think about coming over and joining me on Patreon. I've had a lot of people ask about doing the original series again, seasons one, two, and Firewalk with me now that we have more information. 
I think it sounds like a fascinating idea uh, that, you know, this is the reason why I started the Patreon in the first place is because that, you know, videos like that take a day, if not more. The way that my schedule works is I have to make things that are going to get views. And I don't know that through the entirety of that, that they would get views. Like I've already seen a big drop off in Twin Peaks views since the premiere has only been over for a week already. So I have to be able to keep myself afloat. So if you want to come over and if we can get some support over there, I'd be glad to do a couple of those a month and we'll get through it over time. And if not, I'll just do what I can do. So please follow me on my social media accounts. We have a pretty good lively group over there nowadays on Twitter. Um, Some interesting back and forth going on. So join in with that. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll talk to you soon.